Pixel Worlds is dying. I know it's bad to say such a controversial statement right off the bat, but throughout this video you're going to realise that this isn't far from the truth. After six of the nine people at Kokori Mobile Entertainment decided to resign, it seems things are taking a turn for the worst at this small indie game development company, with their most popular game, Pixel Worlds, not getting a single update in more than half a year. Kokori isn't even bothering to find anyone new to take their places, so it seems this game is being left for dead, possibly along with the company. Throughout this video, I'm going to be covering the following. The complexity of Pixel Worlds and why exactly it's killing the game. The key factors leading to the development team, CEO and everyone in between leaving and how this is going to impact Pixel Worlds, where the game is going to go from here on forward, including what I believe to be proof that almost all in-game events, daily bonus and VIP daily bonus are going on rotation. And finally, how this is all going to break Pixel Worlds content on YouTube. If you couldn't tell already through that brief summary, Pixel Worlds have some very big problems. And while I am going to be talking pretty negatively about Pixel Worlds in this video, I'm also going to be offering ways in which Kokori can act upon the issues the game faces and turn them into positives. It's up to Kokori to decide if they want to take these ideas on board. So without further ado, let's talk about the downfall of Pixel Worlds. Pixel Worlds' first big problem lies at the beginning of all our journeys, the start of the game. When I opened Pixel Worlds for the first time, the tutorial hadn't explained the game as well as I feel it could have. It seemed like a glorified list of orders and tasks that I needed to complete. Click here, do this, click that. It was incredibly boring, with almost all the information being given flying straight over my head. Apart from detailing the use of different controls, the information wasn't really that useful. It mostly included lists of how to farm and crossbreed items, which is often very time consuming and has little to no profit or reward to be made. Not exactly something you want to be showing your new and impressionable players. Its only real application is at the start of the game when you're trying to make your first bits of profit, and even then, other features like mining would yield better results time-wise and profit-wise early game, rendering most of the tutorial useless. The next thing Kokori show you is how to access the shop, and let's be real, that's only because they want to get their hands on your sweet succulent money, as well as teaching you how to buy clothes for gems. In a weird sense, I kind of feel that us buying the clothes pack is the first kind of look we get into Pixel World's giant gap between the rich and poor. They're the first thing we ever equip in the game, cementing the idea that these clothes are bad because of our beginner status in Pixel Worlds. In a way, it makes it worse when you finish the tutorial and enter Pixel Station, the game's main hub, and see everyone around you with way cooler and more expensive clothing items, which are all locked behind paywalls. It creates that sense of urgency, that sense that you need to have these cool and expensive clothes to fit in with the crowd and to be accepted. And the only way to be accepted in a game like this is to be rich. And the only way to be rich is to grind. And to grind, you need to play this game excessively, creating a loop where the only real entity that benefits is Kokori themselves. So yeah, when I first played the game, I found myself skipping over a bulk of the tutorial so I could get to the actual gameplay, which would have been great if there even was any yet. Because after the tutorial, you first need to have a nice long chat about all the features of the game with the numerous NPCs. And when I say chat, I mean you're literally just reading text for about 20 minutes. Truly an exhilarating experience so far. I find it funny how as soon as we download Pixel Worlds, our render distance is set purposely high enough by Kokori that you can see all the different colours and objects around, but not too high enough that it would make you dizzy from all the different things going on at once. I'm fairly sure Kokori did this, so as soon as you enter Pixel Station you get a good look at those big blinking red bubbles with exclamation marks jumping up and down over the NPCs. So you just have to go up and talk to them. As human beings, we are naturally attracted to the colour red, and exclamation marks are often compared with urgency, so it creates this idea that we have to find out what these NPCs have to say, when in reality it's all just a bunch of irrelevant garbage that isn't even important early game, causing players to become overwhelmed trying to remember it all when most of what the NPCs have to talk about is trashy updates that Kokori threw into Pixel Worlds that nobody liked. Yes, I'm talking about you, Jet Race. So as you can see, we're already off to an amazing start. That was sarcasm. But we haven't even scratched the surface yet, because next we have to talk about the starting questline. And unlike the tutorial and NPCs, I really like how it's set out. The tutorial was very controlling with its fast paced orders, which caused people to become disinterested at a very early stage, which is obviously not a good thing. A commenter on Quora perfectly presented this idea. It implies that you should submit or else. This stimulates a rebellious or defiant response in most people, and in the context of Pixel Worlds, people would pick up the game, see the tutorial, and say, you know what? No. And the NPCs, they're just plain boring, there's nothing else to say about them. But with the starting questline, it's sort of on the side. 
We aren't ordered or forced to complete tasks like the tutorial, meaning there's no rebellious or defiant response, but rewards are offered to those who do complete the tasks, giving us the motivation to continue forward because we get that feeling of self-accomplishment and progression when we get something done, compared to the somewhat forced nature associated with the tutorial and the sense of overwhelmingness associated with the NPCs. These positive feelings the starting questline gives off are often multiplied due to what we have experienced prior in the game. So the starting questline, that's good, that's allowed to stay, but the starting tutorial and NPCs no, they definitely need to be changed. This is why now I'm going to be offering Kokori the solutions to the giant holes they've dug themselves into. First of all, the tutorial needs to be changed. And to quote Game Maker's Toolkit, blindly following instructions just isn't a very effective way to learn. What Kokori need to do in their tutorial is guide the players on what exactly they need to do instead of outright saying it, as it gives enough room for people to think for themselves, meaning their brain will be more active. People switch off if they're told what to do all the time. A way they can implement something like this into the game is by changing the somewhat instructive orders like open your inventory by dragging up so they fit into a more user-friendly experience. It could be changed to, what do these buttons do? Why not drag them to find out? As it flicks this curiosity switch inside our heads and encourages us to find out what these buttons do, thus helping us remember when we eventually find out. Boom, tutorial fixed. Now, the next thing we need to do is change the NPCs. Their long strands of dialogue put me to sleep and no one likes reading text. So what we're gonna do is get rid of it completely. Let's change it into something way more inviting, video. Moving pictures combined with audio is considerably more involving than the still image of text because it keeps viewers engaged, and when viewers are engaged, they listen and learn. If you'll remember, the whole point of NPCs in the first place is to educate players about the features of the game, and it's clear that not even that's being done right. With text, there's no real incentive to keep reading, it's not exciting, it's just boring. The Pixel Worlds Game YouTube channel has plenty of videos surrounding all topics the NPCs cover, so if anything, wouldn't it make sense to leave a link to those videos somewhere in each of the NPCs dialogue? That way if players aren't enjoying reading, they can watch the corresponding video about the topic instead. But that's just an idea, so take it with a pinch of salt. So there we go, we've talked about Pixel Worlds complexity, but at the moment fixing that isn't even a big priority. Near the start of the video, you may remember me talking about how 6 of the 9 employees working on Pixel Worlds had decided to quit, and that's the first issue. There are no longer any developers left in Kokori that can even implement any changes, let alone new features. We had Commander K leave near the end of September, he was the founder, CEO and game designer at the company. His role as CEO and founder meant he oversaw the development of Pixel Worlds and managed the operations of Kokori as a whole, while his role as game designer meant he had the job of thinking up almost all aspects of the game. From the UI to features to updates, Commander K was at the front of all of it. The next set of people to leave were Endless, Apov, Dev and Midnight Walker during late December. Endless and Apov were both game artists and worked to design almost everything you see within Pixel Worlds. The blocks, the items, it was all done by them. Dev and Midnight Walker were both programmers and worked behind the scenes to write, change and develop game code whilst also fixing bugs and implementing items created by the game artists. And as far as I'm aware of, the last person to leave the company to this date has been Jake the community manager, who left in early February. He made video content surrounding the game, hosted weekly live streams, and managed communications between the Pixel Worlds community and the development team. After everyone left, the only people who were still working at the company were Siskia, the marketing specialist, Lockalapsy, the data analyst, sorry if I just completely butchered that name, and Bbrex, the junior software dev. Let's start with Commander K, the head of the company. Why exactly did he leave? Well, in recent years, Commander K hasn't been doing his best when it came to ideas for updates. For example, on paper, Jet Race would change Pixel Worlds forever. It introduced Flying Mounts, a special item that would allow players to fly in worlds. But unfortunately, due to the overpriced cost of said mounts and the fact that you had to pay per world you used the mount in, it was eternal for most players, causing the update to become forgotten in the months following. Similarly to this, battle cards aim to create a whole card game inside of Pixel Worlds, but due to the stupid prices of card packs, a large percentage of players that couldn't afford them became disinterested. Not to mention that there was literally no reason to buy the card packs in the first place because the game's card tournament's prizes were not worth the time and money you had to put in to get them. And this isn't just a one-off thing. Almost all Pixel Worlds updates in recent years have died within the months following implementation due to poor development decisions. In fact, mining, Pixel World's greatest update, which topped the charts in Google Trends, wasn't even thought up by Commander K. A veteran player named Siggy produced the base idea for the update as well as other minor things. Dev took the idea, and it came to where it was today, 
So what ultimately undermines the point of having Commander K as a game designer if the best update the game has ever had wasn't even thought up by the man who's supposed to think up updates and features. That's just a little nitpick though. Believe it or not, in the early days of Pixel World's development, Commander K did actually think up some pretty good updates. Updates like Netherworld, Black Tower, the Summer Update, the St. Patrick's Day event, and so, so many more. So what exactly changed to get him from making the best updates ever in the early days to the mediocre update producer he became until his departure from Kokori? And you know what? I think I might actually know. Time. Time is what changed. On Commander K's LinkedIn profile, it says he was working under Kokori for 10 years and 6 months, which is an incredibly long time. Pixel Worlds has only been around for about 5 years as of making this video which means there's a good chance that the game has been worked on behind the scenes for at least a few months or even years. It's most likely Commander K just became bored of Pixel Worlds and the company setting as a whole after surrounding himself with it for so long. An article on Yahoo News states, Boredom can have a long-lasting impact on someone's career. Unhappy employees don't perform to the best of their abilities, which can lead to costly mistakes. And in the context of Pixel Worlds, these costly mistakes are the dwindling quality of Pixel Worlds updates and features. It's perfectly normal to get bored of a job. And if Commander K doesn't believe he's performing his best in terms of thinking up update ideas, it makes perfect sense to leave. It stops the chance that more terrible updates pollute the game in the future, and Pixel Worlds instead gets to take a breather. To quote Jake in one of his many live streams, his heart just wasn't in the company anymore. But after 10 and a half years, Commander K is bound to have gathered up a bunch of work experience and knowledge regarding the game industry. So what does he do with that knowledge? He goes ahead and decides to become the founder and CEO of another game company. This one, called Social First, has 11 people in its staff team including himself and three advisors. I find it strange that he decided to create a new game company when Kokori and Mobile Entertainment was already perfectly fine. Perhaps it was to limit his association with Pixel Worlds and Kokori as a whole. After all, as much as we deny it, Pixel Worlds is pretty much a copy of Grotopia, a game released 5 years prior. Things like UI, basic features, and many more things are scarily similar if you compare the two side by side. The only difference is that the art style is amazingly better in Pixel Worlds. Commander K may have also left Kokori and created Social First in order to reap the benefits of Play Ventures, an organisation which specialises in investments for startup gaming companies that Kokori would not be able to use to their advantage as they are not a newly made company. Social First, however, is. And this smart move of switching companies has allowed Commander K to claim a $2.5 million pre-seed investment from Play Ventures and another syndicate. So it's safe to say Commander K is doing pretty well for himself. When Commander K left, I feel that was the turning point for the whole of Pixel Worlds, and perhaps influenced the decisions of other developers to leave. A phenomenon called contagious dissatisfaction is common in all companies. It follows the idea that one person may not be satisfied with their job, they leave, and then multiple other employees start to consider leaving as well. And that seems to be exactly what happened at Kokori. Commander K leaving created that domino effect knocking down the entire company. What makes it interesting is that two months after Commander K left, the four developers Endless, Dev, Midnight Walker, and Apov were leave Kokori and join Commander K at Social First. I know this because after a bit of research and looking through the LinkedIn profiles of everyone at Social First via their website, four of the employees have ties to job roles within Kokori, with two of them having programming experience and the other two having art direction experience. And they all left Kokori around the same time. Maybe they were feeling similar to Commander K, unhappy with Pixel World's current state and ready to move on to something new. Moreover, joining Social First meant that each of the developers would be able to continue collaborating with each other and their original CEO, Commander K, even if it is under a new company. And then there's the last person to leave, Jake. And since he made a video on the topic, it's way easier to get an insight into why he left. The video in question, titled I Quit Goodbye Pixel Worlds, goes incredibly in-depth about his own motives behind leaving. He says, I have to think about myself, I have to think about my future, and I have to think about my mental health, suggesting that perhaps he wasn't very happy with Kokori's state either. He goes over what motivated him into leaving, most prominently a job offer from the game company Do Dreams, most known for their app Drive Ahead. Throughout the video, Jake expresses points similar to contagious dissatisfaction, which I talked about earlier. I got this chance to work on another game, or keep doing what I've been doing for the past six years, Years. And just like Commander K and the other four developers, it seems Jake was ready to move forward as well. But before Jake left, he first worked with B Bricks, a programmer, to create the spring cleaning update. Since there was no game artists in Kokori anymore, Jake used his photo editing skills along with the base models of old items in the game to form new ones by making slight adjustments like recoloring. Things like the golden visor were used as the base model for the crimson visor, dragon mask for green dragon mask, and so on and so on. 
Jake also happened to have some coding experience under his belt, and he worked with B-Bricks to code and implement various quality of life changes into the game, as well as a ton of items we haven't even seen yet. Jake said in relation to the update, we decided to create features that you guys don't see yet, and make sure that whatever happens, Pixel Worlds will continue going forward. After hearing that statement, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to assume that not even Jake was certain of the game's future. Of course, after nearly everyone in the whole development team left, it would make sense to create an update that implements some items and features that we don't see yet. What Kokori are doing is slowly introducing these items created to keep some form of hype present in the game, even though it is very, very thin at this point. Now, when it comes to hype in Pixel Worlds, there's one core mechanic that does it better than any other events. And this game has a lot of them. Most of these events have unique and limited items developed by Pixel Worlds game artists. After a specified event would be over, the items associated with the event would become unobtainable. These same events would come back every so often with new and more interesting items than the last. And these items wouldn't come back after that, so when they're gone, they're gone. Events created a feeling of FOMO, which is the fear of missing out, while also creating massive amounts of hype. Everyone flocks to the game trying to get these new items before they are unobtainable because they think if they don't, they'll miss out. This causes an increase in player base around the time the event is present because none of them would want to miss out on the opportunities these events give. But ever since the main development team left, there haven't been any game artists to create the new items for these events, so the free people staff team do the next best thing, which is to put these events on rotation, with the same items coming back each year. You might be saying, Spirit, how the heck do you know these events are going on rotation? There isn't even any proof of this being the case. And the thing is, there is proof, or at least I think it's proof. Let me explain. Before most of the development team left, they had the tendency of leaving the years in the description of event items that would be limited. This would give players the reassurance that yes, this is a limited item, and it's not coming back. Fast forward to after the main development team left, and items from events that should be limited don't actually contain the years in their descriptions to confirm whether or not they're limited. For example, the Cinco de Mayo event, sorry if I just completely butchered that as well, has been running since 2018. It comes back each and every May and gives you the chance to obtain special sombreros. Each sombrero would be unique to the year they came from, which we could clearly tell from the years in their descriptions. But this year's Cinco de Mayo event, which conveniently took place after the main development team left, hasn't had any year in its sombreros description, which is awfully strange considering all the sombreros before it did have years. So there's a good chance that the one sombrero that didn't have the year on it in its description is going on rotation. Since all the game artists left, putting items like the sombrero on rotation makes sense because it keeps some form of hype or FOMO present in the game. And this doesn't just apply to the Cinco de Mayo event either. Other events like St. Patrick's Day follow a similar trend, with the yearly event events grand prizes containing dates up to the point where the developers leave. The latest St. Patrick's Day event has grand prizes like the Bird Tribe Shaman Wings and the Shamrock Guitar, which are completely void of any years to show whether or not they're limited. So maybe these two items are going on rotation as well. In fact, this trend isn't even restricted to events. The bulk of the development team left near late December. And whoa, what a coincidence! From that moment forward, all daily bonus and VIP daily bonus items don't actually have a year in them to confirm whether or not they're limited. If it was just one time that an item didn't have a year in it when it otherwise should have, then I would let it fly. But the fact that so many items that should have a year in them don't lead me to believe that this isn't a coincidence. That combined with the fact that this all started happening after the main developers left and things start to get a little weird. It's likely that this is done on purpose and these event items, daily bonus items and VIP daily bonus items are going on rotation with each one coming back in their corresponding year or month. Here I've compiled a list of everything I believe to be going on rotation in Pixel Worlds. Do what you want of this information, I don't really care. Pause the video if you want to screenshot it. Done? Okay. And if you think the idea of things going on rotation in Pixel Worlds is new, it's not. The superhero event, mining wheel, and jet race mystery chest have all gone on rotation before, so it's easy to assume Kokori could do it again. And if what I said about items going on rotation is true, it would be absolutely catastrophic for Pixel Worlds. Hoarders with tons of these items would lose everything in a matter of days due to the item's value dropping. New players would have even less profiting opportunities than they would have before, making it harder for them to progress in the game. And above all else, Pixel Worlds will lose almost all hype and FOMO surrounding itself. People will have nothing to look forward to in the game game and likely decide to quit and move on to other games. But not only will it be terrible for Pixel Worlds, but it will be terrible for Pixel Worlds on YouTube. If you don't know already, Pixel Worlds videos on YouTube are incredibly profit-based. We can split Pixel Worlds profit-making down into five categories. 
trading profit, fishing profit, farming profit, mining profit, and event profit. Events are a really big part of Pixel World's profiting due to all the opportunities they hold profit-wise. So if what I said about event items, daily bonus items, and VIP daily bonus items going on rotation is true, it means there'll be even less topics for Pixel World's YouTubers to cover. Because no one is going to watch a video about an event if they know the same items in the same event are coming back in the next year. The event is no longer special. Rotation strips away all FOMO or hype the event may have had previously, rendering it meaningless. Not to mention it won't even hold any profiting opportunities for people. Community members take part in events for the limited items so they can get the limited items, hold them until the event ends, watch the average value of the item sold due to the fact it's limited and now unobtainable, and then sell it in order to gain profit. But if the item is on rotation, it will never rise due to the fact that people know it's coming back to the game at a later date. And if you thought that was bad, the event items coming back each year means there'll be even more of them in the economy than ever. And if the amount of the event item rises, it means the demand for said item will also lower, meaning in turn the price of that event item will drop further and further each time the event that item is connected to comes to Pixel Worlds, making all of the game's player base miss out on profiting opportunities. But the people who miss out more than anything are Pixel Worlds YouTubers, because most of them would showcase and profit off of these event items in order to gain views and subscribers. But if the event items are going on rotation, there's no point showcasing or profiting off of them more than once in a video as the content will get boring. Event content getting boring will mean the event profit category category will become almost redundant, and Pixel World's YouTubers will flock to different categories of content. This will ultimately turn out even worse, because it means more of the same type of videos in each of the categories of profiting content will be produced meaning Pixel Worlds on YouTube will become repetitive and uninspiring, with everyone fighting to create the same video in a depressing grind for YouTube fame. And it's not all bad. Different types of content like essays and commentary videos seem to be having more attention than ever, with some YouTubers like Ekip Ali, Devs, and me taking the trend by storm. And if you don't believe me, the video you're watching right now is a video essay on Pixel Worlds, meaning this type of content is working. Maybe essay and commentary styled videos will grow to take the place of event profiting videos, and the change will ultimately turn out to be a good thing. But what's definitely not good is the impact that the rotation of events will have on Pixel Worlds. So what can Kokori do to change that? Well, the only real way to fix an issue as big as this is to get a whole new development team. That way Kokori wouldn't need to put events on rotation because they can just make new items for them, and thus Pixel Worlds creators would have a much broader set of videos that they could make. Perhaps essay and commentary styled Pixel Worlds videos will rise up regardless of if event profiting videos step down. But seeing the current condition of the game, I don't think that's going to happen. If Kokori were ever going to get a new development team, they wouldn't have chosen to put events on rotation. It's obvious Kokori don't plan on hiring any new staff for the company, because if we go to the Kokori Mobile Entertainment website, there are no open positions being advertised, and a quick search of Kokori Mobile Entertainment jobs brings up nothing of interest either. A marketing specialist, data analyst, and junior software dev are all you really need to keep a game running at optimal level. Maybe doing things like putting events on rotation will preserve the game for years to come, and in the end, give more positives than negatives for the game's future generation. The spring cleaning update may have only been released to polish some of the earlier features of the game, as well as implementing a few quality of life changes, showing that Kokori does care about the Pixel Worlds community, even with the diminishing amount of people in the staff team. Sometimes in life, things don't go the way we want them to, and you know what? That's okay. And hey, if this video helped or entertained you in any way, why not donate to me in the world's spirit donate? The top 3 donations from this world will be put in the description of this video and my channel, and all profits from the donations will go straight into making videos for you all, as well as prizes for future giveaways. That's all I got for now, see ya. Also please donate, I'm begging you.